Hey, what's going on guys? It's ETA Prime back here again. Today we're going to be taking a look at a pretty interesting little single board computer known as the Orange Pi Zero 2. Now this is a very inexpensive little single board computer, going anywhere from $15 to $19 depending on the RAM version you get. And I would definitely recommend getting the more expensive one with one gig of RAM. It's just going to perform much better across board with all the operating systems that are available. Now even though the one gigabyte model retails for $18.80, you still got to pay shipping anywhere from $8 to $12, so that does drive the price up. Personally, I spent $28 for this unit here, and it took a month to ship to me. I'm in the U.S. If you're in another part of the world, it might get to you a little quicker. But I think one of the main things this has going for it is the size. As you can see, I mean, this is a super tiny single board computer, and it's actually packing some decent specs for the form factor here. Now, like I mentioned, they offer a couple different RAM variants of this. 512 megabytes of RAM up to one gig. I would definitely recommend picking up the one gig model. It will perform better across the board. Now, if we take a close look at the board, we only have a single USB 2.0 port, but they do offer another little hat for this that'll add a 3.5 millimeter audio jack and two more USB 2.0 ports. And just to give you an idea of the size of this thing, on the right hand side, we have a Raspberry Pi 4, 8 gigabyte model. On the left hand side, the Orange Pi Zero 2. This thing's half the size of the Raspberry Pi 4, but as you can see, we don't have that built in I.O. You will have to add that extra board if you want more USB ports and an audio jack. This does have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth built in right out of the box, and it does come with an antenna. We got 26 GPIO pins on one side and another 13 pin header on the other, and this was specifically designed for that USB add-on board. Overall, I am a big fan of the form factor here. It does not support eMMC storage. You do have to run your operating system from a micro SD card, but I have tested up to a 512 gigabyte card, and it does work right out of the box. As for IO ports here, we have a single USB 2.0 port, Micro HDMI, just like the Raspberry Pi 4. USB Type-C, only used for power in. They recommend 5 volts, 2 amps, and gigabit Ethernet. Taking a look at the specs of the Orange Pi Zero 2 for the CPU, we have the All Winner H616. This is a quad-core Cortex-A53 CPU at 1.5 gigahertz. The GPU is the Mali-G31. You can get this with 512 megabytes of RAM or 1 gigabyte of RAM. It uses DDR3. Storage is handled by a micro SD card. We have 802.11ac Wi-Fi built in, that gigabit Ethernet, and Bluetooth 5.0. And as for supported operating systems, over on their website, you can pick up the Android image, Ubuntu image, Debian, and they also have the Linux source code and Android source code listed in case you want to build your own operating system. So yeah, at $18, I do think this has some pretty decent specs. Now, I wanted to keep this thing as cool as possible so we could get the maximum performance out of it, so I just added a cheap fan and heatsink that I picked up on Amazon for the Raspberry Pi. Runs on 5 volts, plugs right into the GPIO, and it should keep this board nice and cool indefinitely. So when it comes to low-powered single-board computers like this, the first thing I always like to test is Android. That kind of gives me a little bit of a gauge on how well this thing performs. Like I mentioned, there are other operating systems available, and if you guys are interested in seeing any of those, Debian or Ubuntu, just let me know in the comments below. But for this one, we're going to go with their Android 10 build. Alright, so here we are. This is the Android 10 version they have available on their website. Unfortunately, this does not have Google Play built in, so we don't have Google services or anything like that. And uh, a lot of the stuff that I sideloaded just won't launch, like YouTube here. You need Google Play services for it to work correctly. And just crashing in general has kind of been an issue with uh, different apps and stuff. Redream, I can't even get it to launch. Just goes to a black screen for a second. Um, Minecraft, since I don't have Google Play services built in, they can't verify that I own the app, so I couldn't run this. I'm sure there's ways around that with this game here, but I was able to get a few other games up and running. Um, one other thing was Geekbench 5 would not run, and a couple other benchmark apps that I wanted to run on this unit just crashed halfway through. So yeah, I mean, it definitely needs some work here with this operating system. I'm actually not a big fan of this interface here. If we head over to settings, this is more of an Android TV build for this unit. I was kind of hoping it was more of the phone version, but unfortunately I think they went with the Android TV version because even if we go into device preferences here and... Let's just say settings. I mean, we don't have any other options here. This is more of the Android TV look, as you can see. Now, what I did was sideload a few apps that I couldn't get from different app stores. I do have Aptoid installed, and if you did want to install some applications from there, you can. But like I said, there's a lot of stuff that just isn't going to run properly because we don't have Google services built in. But the stuff that I did get to run actually works really well on this little board, especially 
given the fact that this is an $18 single board computer. And to tell you the truth, I was actually pretty impressed here. So up until right here, none of this stuff comes preloaded. All of this is sideloaded either from my phone, other APKs, or the Aptoid App Store. Basically, what you're going to get is your file manager, gallery, you'll get Miracast, music. Down here, you'll have your settings, apps, and storage. And really, that's about it. So you do have to do some work to get stuff installed. But uh, the stuff that is running on this little board here works pretty decently. First thing I wanted to get into was the only benchmark that I could get running, which was 3D Mark. And by the way, since this does have Bluetooth built in, I was able to connect my Xbox controller and I can control everything with the Xbox controller, but I also have a keyboard and mouse plugged in at the time of making this right here. So my device, my results. We can't use the Vulkan back end on this board. This build of Android just doesn't have it built in, but OpenGL ES 3.0 with Slingshot, we scored a total of 330. Definitely low when you're comparing this with Android phones, even cheaper Android phones. But for the price of this board here, I don't think it's that bad. I've actually tested more expensive boards that uh, scored lower than this. Moving over to some video streaming. Since we can't do YouTube, I figured I'd go ahead and do Plex. Let's start out with a lower bitrate video. This is 1080p, 68.4 megabits per second. We are set at maximum remote streaming here. And it does load up pretty quickly. And plays just fine. So this is a lower bitrate 1080p 60fps video and it works great. Now if they're claiming that this little chip is capable of 4k, we'll get back into Plex and test something a little more demanding. 4k 60fps 78 megabits per second. Now, with this one here, I actually plugged in Ethernet. I'm not over Wi-Fi. I wanted to get the best connection as I could. Does take a little while to load, but once it loads up, it actually plays pretty smooth. This was actually really surprising seeing that we could do 4K on this little board. Next up, a little bit of native Android gaming. Now, I personally didn't have really good luck with getting a lot of games to launch, but luckily, Real Racing 3 is just one of those games that basically works on everything, and performance here is pretty decent. This is definitely on par with the S905 X3 or the X4. Next on the list, we have some emulation. Now, when it comes to the lower end stuff like NES, SNES, Game Boy, Game Boy Advance, PC Engine, Neo Geo, FBA, I have no doubt that they're going to run at full speed, so I wanted to test some higher end stuff. First up, we have PlayStation 1. I'm using RetroArch with the PCSX ReArm Core. And as you can see, it's running great here. And going into this, I actually expected it to do PS1 pretty well because it doesn't take much to run PlayStation 1 games. But what I wasn't expecting was decent N64 emulation. Now, unfortunately, my favorite standalone app, Moopin64 Plus FZ, just kept crashing on me. So I had to resort to Moopin Plus AE, but overall, I mean, N64 on this little unit is pretty decent. I'm sure we'll run into some games that aren't going to run at full speed. But overall, I'm really surprised to see this kind of performance out of this little board. Next up, PSP using the standalone version of PPSSPP. Starting off light here with Guilty Gear, 2D game. 1x resolution, OpenGL back in, no frame skip, no hacks. It's running at full speed. Every once in a while, I do see it dip down. But I did run into some issues when I tried to play some harder to run games, like Tekken 6. So here we are, no hacks, 1x resolution, no frame skip, and it's definitely unplayable. So I wanted to see how it acted with frame skip on, at least set to 1. This should bring us to 30 FPS because this game runs at 60. And it's still pretty unplayable like this. And this isn't the hardest to run PSP game. I consider this a mid-range game. So we're going to go to a pretty easy one to emulate. Soul Calibur Destiny. So I went into this one with no frame skip on, 1x resolution, and all the hacks that I can run. And I'm still getting really bad performance. So I went through, turned frame skip to 1 just to see what would happen here. And again, with these harder to run games, this little board just isn't going to cut it. Now I'm 100% sure that there are PSP games that this little board's going to run just fine, but it's not going to do the harder to run games. Still, with all things considered, this is an $18 single board computer. I think it's doing a great job with emulation. 
You saw PlayStation 1 and 64 ran good. There are some PSP games that are going to run fine on this board. And anything underneath that will run at full speed. Like I said, you want to get into some SNES, Game Boy Advance, PC Engine, Neo Geo. You're going to have a great time with it on the Orange Pi Zero 2. So far, with the build of Android that I've tested on the Orange Pi Zero 2, this is definitely worth $18. You will have to put a little bit of work into it, getting some apps installed and things like that. It's definitely not a super powerful single board computer, but for the price here, I think it's a decent little specced out unit. Now keep in mind, if you're in the US, you're going to pay a little bit of shipping for this, so the price on this board will come out to around $28 to $30, and even at that $30 price point, if you're looking for an inexpensive single board computer to tinker around with, I think this would be an awesome little option. But that's going to wrap it up for this video, really appreciate you watching, if there's anything else you want to see running on this board, either in Android, Debian, or Ubuntu, just let me know in the comments below. I'd actually like to make a Debian and Ubuntu video on this, and I'm probably going to do it in the next couple days, so keep an eye out. But that's it for this one, and like always, thanks for watching.